right, it's great timing. Welcome back to CS125. We are about halfway done. Actually, I looked at, we started to compute sort of total scores for you guys, and we'll have those available over the next few days, but I was looking, and at this point, we've provided about half of the assessments that we're going to use in the class. Um, I actually think that's kind of nice, in a sense, because we're about halfway done with the semester, and we'll talk a little bit about what happens next on Wednesday, which is almost the exact midpoint. Um, but, you know, th one of the things we've done this semester is we've designed the assessments intentionally to sort of be cumulative over the lifetime of the course. So there's no big final exam that's worth 20% of your grade that's, like, lurking in December. That's not happening, right? We're 50% of the way through the semester, and we've completed about 50% of the assessments in the class, all right? So what we have in front of us is more of the same. Topics are different, um, but, you know, the style of what we're doing is not going to change as we go forward. We do get to talk about some cool stuff, though. And today is one of those cool topics. So this is something that's new for 125 this semester, and it's a topic that I'm introducing because it's incredibly important to understand how to build computer software um, and how to build computer programs. So this is this idea of interfaces. We'll see how far we get today. Uh, if necessary, we'll wrap this up on Wednesday. But my plan is roughly throughout this week to finish up our discussion of object-oriented programming and object-oriented design Next week, we're going to start talking about algorithms and data structures, um, and that will sort of consume us for the rest of the semester. But it'll also give us a great chance to practice a lot of these ideas, because as we build algorithms, as we implement algorithms and build some simple data structures, we'll be using both the concepts that you've learned from imperative programming and a lot of these cool ideas from object-oriented design. So we'll have a chance to practice both. All right, so... Let's start off today by looking at just one quiz question. The, the, the programming questions from, Q, from quiz five are available as part of the 125 assessment, so I'm not gonna go through those. People did pretty well in those. Um, static is something that's still giving some of you a little bit of trouble. So I just you know, want you to be very careful with this. In general, a good rule of thumb for when to use static is not. Um, you know, it's, it, unless we specifically ask you, it's rare that we actually want a static variable or static, a static variable in particular. Static methods, useful, because they sort of provide these library routines that I can run without needing to have an instance of that class. But static variables, very uncommon. So this is one of the questions on the quiz. I created a class called Laptop. I created uh, three instances of the Laptop class. The class has an instance variable called model that's of type string. It also has a class variable called count that's of type int. It's a class variable because I've marked it as static. So how many copies of this variable are there when the program starts to run? One. How many will there ever be? One. There is always one. There will never be more. There will never be fewer. So every time the constructor runs, it increments count. When this code finishes running, what's the value of count? Starts at zero. Every time I create a new object, I'm incrementing it, so it's tracking the number of new instances of laptop have been created. How many times do I see the new keyword in my main function? Three. So when I'm done, it's three. So again, this is something that's really, really critical to get right. If you're struggling with this, experiment. You know, take a simple class. You know, this is not a bad example to use. You can cut and paste this into our little um, online playground and just see what happens when you take a variable market as static, remove that keyword, and make sure you understand the differences that you observe. But again, when we're talking about variables, it's very rare to mark a variable as static in Java. Methods, yes. Variables, not so much. All right, so I want to back up and finish our conversation that we started on Friday about references. And I want to remind you that what we're going to talk about for the next five, ten minutes is um, a little bit of Java internals. It's pretty cool, actually. This is one of the features that distinguished Java when it arrived on the scene uh, back in, I think it was, well, I should know this. When was Java released? Somebody can look this up for me. Um, at the time, you know, Java now is an old language. At the time, 
Java had a lot of really novel features. And one of the ones that we're gonna talk about today was one of the features that was very distinctive about Java when it was introduced. Um, you know, like many other programming languages, it's rare that a widely used language is the first language to offer a particular feature. And this is not the case in Java either. There's lots of new languages that are being developed all the time. Many of them are being developed to try out new ideas. And so when a big, you know, commercial language like Java or Go or something like that arrives that's being supported by a company and a lot of smart people are working on, usually what it does is it borrows ideas from other places. And that was the case with this as well. But today we're gonna talk about this bit of Java internals because mainly it's important. It's also interesting and kind of cool to understand how Java uses references to manage computer memory. But let's review what a reference is first. So last time we revealed that when we talk about object instances, what's actually being stored in those variables is a reference to an object, not the object itself. And a reference is something that I can use to refer to a particular instance of an object, but it's not the object itself. And so there are some good examples of references drawn from your daily life that you can think about. You know, a phone number is not a phone. A street address is not the house. Um, a social security number is not a person, but these are all things, these are references, that we can then dereference to get access to the thing itself. So I can use Google Maps to look up your street address and I can go there. I can call your phone number, right? I can, um, you know, if I work for the government and I have a reason to do so, I can take your social security number and I can convert it into information about you. Your name, your age, where you live, stuff like that, okay? Copying references doesn't copy the underlying object. So, you know, and this is something that's true of, you know, references in the real world as well. If I make a couple copies of my street address, I'm not copying my house. I'm just copying the reference to my house, um, right? So here was our diagram show that shows what happens when I copy a reference. So at this point in this small example, I've created a instance variable called me that will eventually store a reference to an object of type person, but right now stores nothing. No, that's, a, that's the default value for an uninitialized reference. Now that I've initialized it, now I see that I have this person object that I've created using the new keyword. I also have a reference to it. If I make a copy of that reference, so again, here what I'm doing is I'm assigning the value of me to a new reference variable called you. But this does not copy the object. There is still only one person object. Remember that a rule of thumb is, if I don't see new, I haven't created an object. So in this case, I didn't say person u is equal to new person, I said person u is equal to me, and so what I have here are now two references to the same object. Changes made by either one of those references to that object are visible to both, because they're both acting on the same underlying object. There's only one object here. So even regardless of which reference I use, I'm modifying the same object. Okay. There was someone asked a great question on the forum about this. So there's this question of what happens when I call a function and I pass it an argument that looks like an object. So what that function receives is a copy of a reference to the object. So in this case, on line 11, I'm creating a new person. I'm saving a reference to that person into this instance variable me, and then I'm calling this function birthday. And so when birthday starts to run, it receives a copy of my reference variable me. So it now also has a reference to the same object that I created on line 11, and so it can modify that object. This is one of the things that's important to understand, but also very powerful about functions in Java is that they can modify the object that I created. So the caller created the object, it calls a function, it passes that function, what looks like the object, but what the function actually receives is another reference to the object. By using that reference, all the changes I make are visible to the callee of the function. And so, you know, here's a diagram showing what happens here. Once birthday starts to run, its local variable to set is a copy of the reference that was passed. So it can modify the same object. What it cannot do is it can't modify 
the reference that was passed. It can't change me. So there's no way when this function returns that me is going to refer to any other person object than it did when the call started. So that's important to understand. Some of you may have been wondering up till this point why this check style require that I mark function parameters as final. This has come up a few times. This is why. Because if I change to set to refer to another object, I'm not changing me. When the call finishes, the caller still has a reference to the same object that they had when the call started. And so the reason why check style requires that you mark function parameters as final is that usually modifying those parameters doesn't do what you think. It doesn't work. Sometimes it's the right thing to do, and there's times when you have to fight a little bit with check style to get this to work, but rarely is this the right thing to do. Usually, you need to think about some other way to solve the problem, because modifying that reference variable does not modify the caller's reference. Is there questions about this? This is important to understand. So I can take two set, and I can point it to another object. I wish I had a, a diagram for that, but it doesn't change what me refers to. The caller's reference cannot be changed. Now, there are some languages where you can do this. And in general, this can create a huge nightmare. Um, and so the fact that Java doesn't allow this is not necessarily a bad thing. Okay. When the, when the call completes, so let me just point something out. When the call completes, so when the call is active, there are two references to the person object. When the call completes, the person, the two set reference is gone. It's out of scope. So that reference is discarded. I still have one reference to the object that the caller still holds. We'll see why this is important in a minute. Okay. All right, so we did this. This, this is an example with arrays. So the last bit of review is about copy. So if we wanted to copy objects, we can't just copy a reference that doesn't copy the underlying object. We actually have to do some work. So you can essentially override clone if you want to, or you can provide other ways to copy an object. You could provide a static method on the class that takes an object and returns a new instance that's a copy of that object. You can provide a copy constructor, a constructor that takes another instance of the object and copies over the fields that you want. The reason this is hard is that there's usually some sort of object-specific state, and, you know, I want to handle this on a per-class basis. It's not as easy as just making a copy of all the memory that that class uses, because there's some variables I might need to re reinitialize or whatever, right? So the semantics of what it means to copy an object are actually up to the class. This is very similar to equals and other things, right? What does it mean for two objects to be equal? You get to define that as the class designer when you implement that method. Same thing when you copy. What does it mean for a new object to be a copy of an existing object? That's up to you to define. Okay. So this is about where we stopped last time, and I just want to make a distinction here between uh, two types of object copy in Java, because this, this can trip you up a little bit. So here I have a, a person class, and the person class has a single instance variable called pet. And I've implemented a, a pretty straightforward copy constructor here. So you might think that this is what, you know, you do in a copy constructor, right? It's just like, I just copy over the, my instance variables to the new instance. So the constructor's running, I'm setting up my new object, I've been passed another instance of person, and I just copy over the variables one from another. That seems pretty straightforward. What's wrong with this? What is wrong with this copy constructor? Or what, what, what about it might not work in the way that you expect? Yeah. Wait, hold on, hold on, up in the front. Yeah. Yeah, so on line four, remember, is there a new pet object being created? Do I see new? No. So what I'm doing here is I'm actually copying the reference to the pet. So when I get done with this, I have two person objects. I had one when the constructor started running. That's what I was passed. 
and I'm creating a second, the constructor is running, so someone must have called new, but I haven't created two pets. And so when I'm done, I will have two person objects, but still one pet. And so, for example, if the first person decides to change their pet's name to something else, then that change will be visible to both. So essentially I have two people that are sharing ownership over a single pet, which may or may not be what you want. Frequently when you run a copy constructor, it's not what you want. So the right thing to do here potentially is you need to copy the pet as well. So when you're done, I want a new person that has no connections to the old person whatsoever. So there's no way that I should be able to take the person that I ran the copy constructor on, that instance of person, make changes to it that are visible to the new person that's being created. This is something that we're testing for is part of MP3 and one of your um, copy methods. Okay. So sometimes we call the, this version of a copy a shallow copy. Just wanna make a distinction between these two pieces of terminology. So a shallow copy gives me a new object, but it doesn't give me any copies of anything that that object has references to. So it copies the object itself, but it doesn't copy any of the other objects that that object might refer to. A deep copy, on the other hand, copies everything all the way down. So a deep copy will make, will start by making a copy of the object, and then it'll make copies of all the objects that that object has a reference to, and then it'll keep doing that. So I actually have to, so pet, has to implement some type of copy constructor or some way to copy that object. And then if pet has a reference to some other kind of object, that has to support this, right? So this is where this gets tricky. This has to work all the way down uh, until I get to objects that just have re references to primitive types. Okay. We've talked about equals already. I'm just gonna skip over this. All right. The last thing I wanna point out, and then we're gonna actually go back to the example from, um, Friday, that's important to understand about this, is that Java uses the reference type, not the underlying object type when it's matching function signatures. Remember, when I call a function in Java, there's this process where the compiler has to look for some function it can find that matches the signature that I'm, that I'm using. So I'm trying to call the function named foo, and that foo function named two takes a certain type of arguments. I've gotta look for that function. I start out by looking on that class, and then maybe I look for static methods on that class, and then I look for methods on my parent class, and I keep doing this. So this is process of, of matching, right? Where I'm looking for a function that has the right signature, and I might do some casting to find that as well. I might realize, oh, there's a method that takes an object, and I can upcast this safely to an object and use it. But what gets used here is the reference type, not the object type, all right? So let me, let's go back. So this was our example based on last week's homework that we did last time. I have several different types of pet. And our goal here was to implement a static method on the pet class that would take any instance of pet. If the pet was a dog, it was supposed to call wolf. If the pet was a cat, it was supposed to call meow. If the pet was other, it was not supposed to do anything. And one of the ways that we solved this problem last time if you remember, was that we added, we used method overriding. And we relied on the fact that if I call speak with a dog reference, it's now going to match this other version of the function. So it's not going to match pet, it's going to match dog, and it's gonna call dog.wolf. And I can do the same thing with the cat. Okay, and this worked last time. It doesn't work anymore. Why not? It's different about this. I made a small change to the driver code. I'm still creating a dog on line 38. I'm still creating a cat on line 39 and a turtle on line 40. And I'm passing those to speak. So why isn't this working? Again, this worked last time. Or who can see the change that will cause this to start working again? Yeah. Nope. 
No, it was static last time. Yeah. <coughs> What's that? Ah. So look at the look at line 38. What's happening here? So the right side of line 38 is creating a dog. But then it's saving that reference as a pet reference. Why can I do this? Because it's safe to do this upcast. So Java is doing the upcast for me. It's saying, "Okay, well dog inherits from pet." So whatever methods that pet provides, Whatever methods dog provides must be a subset of the methods that pet provides, and so I can upcast that to a pet safely. This is the Liskov substitution principle in action. But when I call pet.speak on line 41, I'm passing it a pet. So again, my dog is still a dog, and I can downcast it to a dog if I want to. But when I call speak, I'm passing speak a pet reference. I'm passing speak a pet reference on line 41, I'm passing speak a pet reference on line 42, and on line 43. So this is the tiny little change I made to this that will cause it to start working again, or cause it to stop working. So now what I'm doing is dog is a dog reference, and so when Java looks for a method called speak, it finds a method called speak that takes a dog reference, and that's the method that gets called. If I upgas that to a pet, I can put a print in here so we see what's happening. So now this general pet speak method that takes a pet reference is getting called every time. So my dog, my cat, my turtle, they never stop being the kind of object that I created them as. This is polymorphism. It's still a dog. I can downcast to a, to a dog. It still has a woof method. But because I'm passing speak a pet reference, this is really important to understand. The reference type dictates what speak can do with that. So because I've upcast it to a pet, it matches the speak method that takes a pet reference, not the one that takes a dog or a cat. And if I want to convert it to a dog reference or a cat reference, I can still do that. So the solution I used before the other solution, if I say if pet so I can still downcast this, and then I can do so this will still work. So I can still do it this way. So this solution didn't stop working, but the solution that relies on method overriding stops working. And the reason is because, like I said on the previous slide, when Java looks for a match, it uses the, the type of the reference that you're passing, not the type of the underlying object. Questions about this before we go on? Okay, awesome. So we're done talking about references for now. We will come back. We're gonna use references over and over and over again. One of the reasons that we're talking about this now is that all of the data structures we're gonna work with and talk about and build together for the rest of the semester are gonna rely heavily on references. Because everything that you do in Java that uses objects does. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, I, I don't know if you can do that or not, yeah. You might be able to. I mean, there, so, so we'll talk about this in a couple of weeks just for fun. And so I don't wanna go too far down this rabbit hole, but Java provides, one of the interesting things about Java as a language is that it provides a, a suite of features that are called uh, reflective features or reflection. 
So Java classes know things about themselves, and you can ask them things like, what methods do you declare? What is your type, right? Do you inherit from a particular thing or whatever, right? And we can do this programmatically. Our test suites do this all the time. So for example, this is how we check to make sure you have the right keywords on your classes when you submit testing code. So it's not something we cover in the class, it's not something that's particularly important for most of the Java programming you're going to do, but we will talk about it a little bit on the spooky Java Halloween lecture just because it's kind of cool, actually. All right, any other questions about this? Again, this is a critical topic. I'm not convinced that everybody understands it yet, that's fine. We'll give you lots more practice with this as we go. All right, cool. So, new idea today, related to polymorphism, related to inheritance, but in many ways, I think this is actually a much, much more powerful concept. Partly because it underlies lots of different types of computer systems. Now, this is this idea of an interface. When you build computer systems, when you build code for other people to use, when you use code that other people have written, when you start to interact with other services online, the idea of an interface is something that's going to underlie all of these interactions. So again, this is not just a Java idea, this is a computer science idea. Actually, a really cool computer science idea, right? All right, so, what is an interface? So I like this definition. It sort of sounds like what it is. It's a boundary. It's a place where two things come together. Two different parts of a computer program. Two different parts of a computer system. Two different entities within a large computer system. It could be you and the computer. It could be the computer and a piece of hardware that you plug in, whatever. So this is a, a, a meeting point. It's a boundary. It's a, a place where two things push up against each other and where there's exchange of information. There's interaction across that interface. So interfaces allow one piece of software to use another piece of software. They allow to, you know, software to use other pieces of hardware. So in computer systems and computer science, we see interfaces all over the place. So there are lots of interfaces between different pieces of software. When you build large pieces of software or use large programs, there's lots of cases where you're going to use another piece of code without understanding anything about how it works except how to interact with it. And when you learn that, what you're learning is, what is its interface? What does it allow me to do? What are the functions that it provides? How do they work? How do they manipulate the information that I'm giving it? So you can see those between two pieces of computer software. You can see interfaces between computer software and computer hardware. That's not a topic we'll cover in this class. Um, between computer, computers and their users, right? So. And interfaces allow different parts of the system to interact, and they also, more importantly, they structure those interactions. So they bring clarity. They bring sort of control and agreement. You know, this is idea we'll talk about in a minute of an interface contract that dictates how those two parts of the system are going to interact with each other. If both sides hold up their end of the agreement, this is incredibly powerful. Right, because it allows a lot of coordination between different parts of a system that aren't being built or maintained by the same person or people. All right, so here's some examples. Software, software interfaces. So there's a gazillion of these, and you guys will start to see some of them um, as you begin work on MP4. But here's an example. So when you are f implementing one of our MPs, or when you're doing one of the homework problems, essentially, what we've done is we've given you an interface to implement. Those write-ups for the little homework problems, that's an interface specification. We haven't called it that yet, but that's essentially what it is. The reason for this is because you need to implement things in a specific way so that our test suites work. So for example, if you decide to call your function foo and we ask you to call it bar, then none of our test cases are going to work. And so, we write down for you the interface that we expect you to complete. A lot of times that is, you know, build a class that does the following things, that provides a certain set of methods. It does a particular thing, we tell you what to call those methods, we tell you what arguments they should take. You get to decide things like what to call those arguments, 
but there's this agreement that we have to come to. If you don't abide by that agreement, then you may have solved the problem, but you don't pass any of our test cases, right? So, but that interface is essential so that the test suites work. You know, again, you can write a beautiful implementation of a connect end like game and get a zero on the MP because you just didn't call the functions the right names or they didn't take the right parameters or whatever, right? So that interface is what we're agreeing on so that our test suites work. Between software and hardware, so this is actually probably one of the more exciting things that's happening in computer science over the past, I don't know, decade or so, is that there's all sorts of stuff in the world now that provides an interface. So for example, the Chromecast that's over there, hooked up to the slide display, you know, that provides an interface to software that uses it. That's essentially a hardware device. Now the boundaries here are pretty blurry because probably what that Chromecast is is a tiny little computer that's running some software that somebody at Google wrote. But from my perspective, it's a piece of hardware. And the idea is in order to use it, my computer and that device have to agree on things. They have to agree on things like, you know, what data are you sending me, right? You know, this, uh, essentially, I'm assuming it's streaming some sort of picture type data, but what format is it? You know, how often are you gonna send me new information? Stuff like that, right? This is all something that these two parts of a system have to agree on. And one of the cool things about the world today, and one of the things that makes it so powerful to be a computer scientist is there are all sorts of things in the world now that provide a programmatic interface for you to use. So one of the projects we haven't gotten to yet this semester, but I'm hoping we will, is that we have plans to put up a sign downstairs in the room where you guys work on MPs that will, that will light up every time somebody finishes the MP, right? That'd be kind of cool, right? How are we doing this? Well, for, I, like for 20 bucks online, I was able to buy a light switch that has an interface, right? So I can plug this thing in, I gotta do a little work, but then I can write a piece of code that turns it on or off. So that's cool. And more and more things in the world are like that. More and more of, you know, the things around us, you know, embedded in the physical environment, you know, cars, robots, light switches, electronics around us, these things are now programmable. What does it mean to be programmable? It means they have an interface. And so if you understand that interface, this is essentially what some of my course developers are doing right now. They're reading the documentation for this little thing to figure out what do I do to turn it on? What do I do to turn it off? Not that complicated. Well, actually, it's taken them a couple weeks, so it's a little complicated, but the point is that it exists, right? And now, because this hardware, this, this thing in the world has an interface, I can write a program to use it, and I can do something like, you know, enable this type of, um, whatever, sort of display. The interfaces you are probably most familiar with are computer-human interfaces. So a display, a keyboard, a, a touching device. You might think a little bit, I mean, a lot of you grew up so embedded in these types of systems that you don't think about how they work and the kind of assumptions that you make when you're using them. But you might think about that a little bit, because for every one of these interfaces, there is an agreement that you have to follow. There's a particular semantics to a GUI-based interface. And I'm probably as used to it as you are, right? Um, you know, some of you have probably seen these memes about, like, little kids that are, you know, using tablets now, right? And will go up to, like, photos and, like, try to, like, zoom them, right? Like, they'll touch, like, a physical photograph and, like, make the zoom gesture because they think that's going to make it bigger. So they've internalized one of those expectations that the interface they've been using is, has been providing, which is that if you make a particular gesture on the screen, something gets bigger. Unfortunately, that doesn't work everywhere. Uh, they'll figure that out. Okay. So for the next, you know, day or so, we're gonna focus on Java software interfaces, but I just wanna make sure that you understand that this is a very general idea. It's not confined to Java, um, and it's much broader in many ways than the specific Java interfaces we're gonna look at. Every single programming language out there has either a formal concept of an interface or an informal concept of an interface. That's how modern software development works. 
So there are certain languages like Java, Go, C Sharp, C++, that include an interface as part of the language design. So there's a specific Java interface that we're gonna look at in just a sec. But every other language still has this idea, because every other language has an ecosystem where a lot of different pieces of code and different parts of the system interact with each other. And every one of those interactions occurs over an interface. All right. I also want to point out that even if you don't use Java's specific idea of what an interface is, your objects in Java are still providing an interface. Every one of them, if it does anything possibly useful to anybody else, provides an interface. And in Java, the interface to a class is simply the methods that that class provides. If they're public, that's a public interface that anybody can use. If they're protected, that's an interface that only the children can use of, of that class, descendants of that class. But any class that provides any sort of publicly accessible methods in Java provides an interface. The interface is that list of methods. That's why we ask you to document them. So the other thing about interfaces is this is a place where we need really, really good documentation. So essentially, you know, how does modern software development work? Frequently, I use large pieces of complicated code that somebody else built. And in order to use them, I, if I had to read all the code they wrote, I would never get anything done. Instead, what I rely on is that they've documented the interfaces that are available for me to use. I read that documentation, and now I know, okay, here's something that I can do with this library. Here's how it works. So now I can incorporate it into my own code without thinking too much about how it does what it does. All I know is that if I call this particular function and I pass this particular information to it, it will do that thing and it will give me something back that's useful. And that's all I have to know. But an interface is, you know, again, it's this place where it's critical to have good documentation. You don't need to write comments for all of your functions in your code. You don't need to comment everything that you're doing. But if you don't provide a good public interface, it's very hard. And good interface documentation, it's very hard for anybody to make heads or tails of what you've done. Okay. So let's look at a Java interface. Here's a Java interface. So it looks a little bit like a class. Public interface add instead of a class. So I have a visibility modifier here. I have this interface keyword, which is new. And then I have a name. So that's how I declare an interface. And then I have one or more methods and variables. But you'll notice something about this, which is that I don't see, this is different than the classes that we've looked at. What's different about it? different about this? Looks kind of like a class. That is true. But what else is different here? There's something that I don't see. Yeah. Well, don't worry about the modifiers. What's missing here? Negative. What do you normally see in a class? Yeah. Yeah, there's no implementation of this method. Right? I see something that looks like a method signature, but there's no body. There's no implementation of this method. It's just a signature. It says int add, so this is a method called add that returns an int. I got that. It takes two parameters. One is, the first is an int, the second is an int. But how does it work? There's, there's no implementation here. Right? So in many ways, Java, uh, Java interfaces look a little bit like objects, except they're missing all of the implementation details. There's no method signature. Sorry, there's no method implementation. There's just a method signature, right? Interfaces can declare both methods and variables. There's a caveat here, though, which is that interface variables are public, static, final by default, meaning essentially they act as constants. So we're gonna see in a minute how I implement an interface by providing an implementation of the method that it says I have to implement. But a variable in an interface, so, so it's, 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 um, it's tempting to think that an interface says, well, your class has to have a variable called whatever, right? 
in fact, what it means is that this variable has this value. So really, interfaces are only good when it comes to variables for declaring constants, because every variable I declare as part of an interface is by default public static file. I can't change it, there's only one copy. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna get there. It's a great question. It's just a few steps ahead of us. Okay. So what is an interface for? Interfaces exist to be implemented. So an interface says, in order to implement me, here are the methods you have to provide and the method signatures. To implement an interface, and again, there's a lot of parallels with class design here, to implement an interface, I use an implements keyword. So now, starting on line four, I'm declaring a new class called adder that implements add. By declaring that, I say that I am going to implement all of the methods that are in the interface specification. So in order to correctly implement the interface, in this case, there is one method I have to implement. It's called add. It takes two integers as arguments, and it returns an int. So what I provided here is the implementation of this interface, okay? So a lot of similarities here with, with class design. Instead of extending another class, meaning I'm gonna inherit from it, I implement an interface, meaning that I agree to implement all of the methods that that interface requires. Okay. So let's try this in our little playground. Uh, okay, so, so the, the error that I'm seeing right here is because I've created an adder on line seven, but I can't convert it to the interface type add because I haven't implemented the methods that I need to implement. So let's do this. Let's provide an implementation for my add method. Well, I mean, this is so simple, we might as well actually do it, right? Oh, I don't like this. Ah, right. Ah, okay. Stumped by my own example. It's good. I just, that, my, my technique there is just get really quiet and hope that I hear guidance from the audience. That seems to work. All right. So I haven't declared that I implement add. Okay, well, let's actually do this first. <laughs> All right, great. So now I'm declaring that I'm going to implement add. But now the compiler has a new error for me, which it says, I have to implement this method, right? So I've declared that I'm gonna implement the add interface, but I haven't actually provided an implementation for the methods that add requires. So now let's provide this. So now this works. Indeed, yes. So the question is, if I implement an interface, do I have to provide every single method? The answer is yes. Let's see how this works. So let's try, we'll create something called add three. This is silly, but it's fine. It takes three arguments. Okay, so now I've changed my interface. So now the interface says, uh-oh, to implement add, you have to implement not only a function called add that takes two integer arguments, but a function called add three that takes three integer arguments, and now I'm gonna have the error I had before. So until you completely uh, uh, implement an interface, your code will not compile. And this is the contract that you are entering into when you declare that you're gonna implement an interface. So this is important. By declaring that you're gonna implement a particular interface, you agree, as the class designer, to implement all of the methods that it requires. 
The cool thing about this, which we'll get to in a few slides, or maybe on Wednesday, is that anyone who now uses your class can rely on the fact that you've implemented those methods, right? So let's do this here. I need to create a new method called add3. This will take three. Now it works again. One thing I want to point out, you don't have to use the same variable names as the interface. So I can do this. Works fine. Yeah. So it's the method signature that the interface is providing here. It says you have to implement a function called add. That function has to take two arguments. Those arguments have to be an integer in the first position, an integer in the second position. It does not say that I have to use first or second as my local variable names. That's up to me. Okay. I'm gonna come back and talk about this in a minute. Okay. So people have asked, I wanna, I wanna finish with this today before we're done. So, so far this seems very, very similar to inheritance and overloading. So the interface is kind of like a parent class. Instead of extending it, I'm implementing it. Um, implement is sort of like extends, right? Um, and providing your implementation is sort of like overriding your parent's method, right? So, so here's an example of this done using inheritance. So here I have a public class called add that provides a method called add that takes two integer arguments. And by extending that public class, I can now provide my own implementation of add. So if I wanted to get this to actually work, that works. Right? And in some ways, this is almost a little nicer, right? Because if I don't provide add, then everything still works. Add doesn't work in this case, because my parent didn't implement it properly. But it almost feels like interfaces are worse than inheritance, right? I don't get all of these nice default methods. I have to Im implement everything, right? So to implement an interface, I have to implement all of the methods that it, it uh, requires. And actually, as someone pointed out previously, it's even more similar than you think. So let me, um, let's toss abstract into the mix. So remember we talked briefly about abstract classes. An abstract class is a class that I cannot instantiate. I can't create instances of that class. I can only extend it. So I can't use new to create an abstract class, but I can't extend from an abstract class. So it turns out in Java there's also something called an abstract method. So I can add the abstract keyword to a method. And like an abstract class, it's similar. An abstract method is a method where the parent does not provide an implementation. But in order to extend, I am allowed to override this method, right? In order to extend the parent, I actually have to override that method. So let's look at an example here using an abstract method. So now what I have at the top is an abstract class called add. Now the class is abstract, meaning I can't create new instances of it. I can only extend it. Now I create a child class called adder that extends add, and you'll see that add provides a public method called add, but there's no body. So this is now looking very similar to an interface. The reason I don't have to provide a body is because this method is marked as abstract. If I try to run this, you'll see another compiler error. The compiler says the non-abstract class called adder that I'm actually trying to create has to implement this method. So essentially an abstract method is a way for a parent class to force me, the extender or a descendant of that class, to implement a particular method. The parent says, you know what? I don't know how to implement this, but I want to require that every one of my descendants implement it, so I'm gonna force you to do it. 
here, let's just finish this and then we'll be done for today. I can provide an implementation of this method. And now this works fine. So on Wednesday, we're gonna pick up here and we're gonna talk about what interfaces are for in Java, why they're different from inheritance, and what makes them so powerful, particularly for some of the work on data structures we'll be doing throughout the rest of the class. All right, I've got two quick announcements. So MP3 is due at five. Good luck finishing it up. MP4 will be out today. It's due in two weeks. And hold on. MP4 is our first MP where we're gonna ha have you start working in Android. We will have time in lab this week to help you get set up with an Android development environment. MP4 is a lot of fun. It's very cool in Android. I think you're gonna have a great time with it. I will see you guys on Wednesday. Good luck on MP3.